seven. All right, so let's talk about a data breach at the Companies and Intellectual Property Commission, CIPC. Okay, so my understanding, this is where a lot of companies are registered for their businesses. And uh, on, I think it was early this week, uh, there was a message on their official website saying there's, they're undergoing urgent maintenance. It's the urgent that got everybody's back up. But anyway, basically the issue is that um, there was a cyber attack, it feels like it, a data breach, and CIPC clients and employees, all their information, um, made its way into cyberspace, hopefully not into the hands of nefarious people in the dark web, but 17 hours of a shutdown is sufficient for a lot of things to happen. And that question is what has happened? What's being done to fortify the situation? What do we do when there's this significant data breach? Um, you know, ransomware. What happens in sort of introducing those kinds of um, extra buffers of security? And who is vulnerable to have had their information making its way into the ether? We're joined by advocate Colin Weaponed. Is that right? It's correct. Weaponed. Uh, we'll that, yes. Okay. 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 Uh, and he's responsible for Popia and information at the Information Regulator. And uh, we also have online Richard Frost, the head of consulting at Amata Cybersecurity. Richard, good morning. Good morning, Rata. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Okay, so gentlemen, please go with us slowly. Okay. So let's start with you, Advocate Weaponed. When we hear that the CIPC <coughs> has had a data breach or some kind of a cyber attack, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Yeah, so Osriato, it's very important for us to understand that um, a data breach in the strict sense and meaning in terms of popia is called a security compromise. Mm. So that's the more formal wording. Okay. So a security compromise can be physical, a physical security compromise where physical documents are compromised okay. or it could be where your systems are compromised so in both of these instances it is quite serious and the regulator is extremely concerned I mean just for this current yeah. um, financial year we're talking about 224 recorded security compromises um, that is from January to date. So we just in the three months. Just in the three months. So that's an extreme concern. But if you look at the CIPC, mm. remember we've got two types of um, protections that are afforded, and the one is for the natural person as well as the juristic person. So when the CIPC's um, database or systems are compromised. We also talk about another form of data subjects whose information is compromised okay. and who are afforded protection in terms of popia, um, and that's quite concerning for us. All right, so the C CIPC, Companies and Intellectual Property Commission, simply put, this is where you register your company. You want to Correct. start a small business, you register it in this particular division of DTI. And not only do you find a name for your company, but you provide your tax records or certainly tax compliance. Uh, because they want to make the system seamless, they encourage you to set up a bank account linked with banks who already are within that framework. And so your banking details are there and then the information of the directors of the company. So it's quite a lot of information Correct. when you consider how many companies have to be registered in South Africa. So how big is this problem? Yeah, so we're talking about an extensive security compromise and the regulator has prioritized the security compromise for the mere fact that sensitive personal information yeah. was compromised and according to our knowledge and understanding um, there might be credit card um, information sure. that have been compromised and that then makes companies vulnerable to attacks, financial attacks, or losses that they can suffer. And that's now the key issue. Um, and the regulator now needs to guide the CIPC in terms of how to notify the data subjects about the security compromise mm -hmm. and the measures that they should put in place to prevent a financial loss or any other loss that they could suffer due to the 
um, types of information okay. that was compromised. And we, I'm staying with you, Advocate uh, Weapon, 17 hours of an IT shutdown. Yeah. 17 hours. That's a long time. Couldn't there have been a speedier intervention? Yeah, so what usually happens is that um, you've got a mean time to detect and then you've got a mean time to respond. Okay. So their mean time to respond is what the information regulator needs to, 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 to focus on in terms of our analysis. Mm. And it's quite a long time to be down in terms of uh, correcting your systems or putting some measures in okay. place to ensure that there's no further exposure okay other than the current exposure that you're already okay. suffering, yes. Okay, so that in that 17 hours, you're sort of doing a SWOT analysis. How big is the problem? How widespread is the problem? Where do we need to plug the holes? Sure. Fix it. That's what you're doing in that 100%. 17 hours. Okay. Richard Frost, let's defer to you here. Uh, when we say cyber attack, what are we talking about? Yeah, so I think there's, there's a couple of variables, right? Um, when there's a cyber attack, normally you have a, a first responder team or a forensics company that will come in to assist and try and see exactly what has actually been breached. I think um, most people will see a ransomware and they'll immediately start trying to recover from the ransom, either deciding to pay the ransom or obviously trying to restore the systems. I think a lot of people also forget that if your systems are offline because of ransomware, there could also have been data exfiltration in the background. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where the Papier regulator comes in, right? We want to know about the actual data that is exfiltrated more than the systems have been offline. Um, so the companies will start working and, and, and trying to restore and recover the systems, but at the same time, they'll be trying to see what information okay. was actually stolen and, and what's out on the internet. Okay, okay. so that's uh, cyber attack. What about yep. hacking? Is this the same thing? We use the words interchangeably. A breach of security, mm -hmm. hacking, cyber attack. Are these the same thing? Yeah, 100%. I mean, if you think about it, the person that's, that's performing the cyber attack would be known either as a threat actor or as a hacker. So hacking, the forms of hacking that you could have would be something like a phishing attack where somebody has sent an email with some form of, of link to a malicious site or some malicious attachment that somebody opened and that could have ingested a malware into the environment. Um, one of the things that's not clear from the CRPC statement is exactly how the breach happened um, or exactly what kind of data was stolen. They do mention the fact that a lot of the information is publicly accessible anyway, so they're not too concerned. But again, as, as our colleague said, it depends on what data was stolen. Was it credit card information, which is not publicly accessible? Um, is it some of the trademark or, or patent information that's been kept as well by, by the CRPC? These are the types of things that the, the hacker would want to get because they can utilize that for further attacks. Mm -hmm. In other words, committing fraud in, in the company's name. Okay. You also used a, a, what we call a South African proverb, when systems are offline. So when systems are offline, is it just the IT just can't, you know, uh, is struggling with the network or is it another indication of a breach or a cyber attack? So I think a lot of companies, until they fully understand what's causing the system to be offline, will use that as a general term. Um, mm. As you said, it could be something as simple as the provider that's hosting the solution being mm -hmm. down. We've seen numerous cases recently of, of you know, cloud-based solutions like AWS and Azure um, having system issues and being offline. It could be related to a networking issue where the ability to connect to that system is not available and therefore the system looks like it's offline. Or it could be some form of cyber threat where something's been compromised in the system and they've been taken offline until they can troubleshoot and actually establish exactly what mm. the fault is. Okay, let's use the word troubleshoot. 17 hours. I've asked the advocate 17 hours and he's explained the process. What can get lost or compromised in 17 hours? So I think focusing on the 17 hours is, is, is an interesting concept, bearing in mind that a lot of the times when we actually do discover that we've been compromised, that malware could have actually been in the environment for more than six months prior looking for information to steal. And I think this is why the companies now, I mean, it could take them weeks or even months to actually determine exactly how much data was exfiltrated um, and to understand fully how much of their, their systems were compromised. We've also seen, you know, from, from other situations where you might have 20 systems, five of them were compromised, the guys fixed the five systems, and immediately a month later their systems are compromised again because they had that malware lying dormant in the environment waiting to reinfect the systems. Mm. So an active threat hunt, which is a terminology we use to go and look for any existing threats that might still be lying dormant or, or lurking in the environment, 
um, is probably another procedure that the okay. CRPT should be following. Okay, so what I understand you to say, and if I used an analogy, unfortunately, of a South African problem, a burglar doesn't just show up in your house opportunistically. They've cased the joint. They've studied you for a couple of days to figure out w- your movements and where there's an opportunity. So here, the hackers have studied the system for six months or weeks and then struck on the day they struck. So we think they just arrived in that 17 hours, but they've been lurking. Is this what you're saying? Yeah, very possibly they could have been lurking, but they could have also been stealing information over that six-month period. Hmm. So your initial attack, your malware that's used, would actually be siphoning information out onto the Internet. I mean, this is a possibility. I'm I'm speculating here. There's no evidence to that. But it could have been grabbing information and, you know, only a, a month or two or six months later, the, the IT systems engineers might have discovered there's a, a problem and started investigating okay. and realized there was actually a malicious attack going on. Right. So the day that you report it and the day you take your systems online doesn't necessarily mean that's exactly when the threat started. It might just have been when it was discovered. Okay. Advocate uh, Colin Weppin, let's come back to you because you're responsible for Poppy at the information regulator. So it's possible that the information wasn't exfiltrated, to use that word, on that day. It's been leaving the system piecemeal a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And so how would people who don't work at the CIPC know that they've been compromised? How does a small business owner here uh, recognize that something is untoward? It's the unfortunate part, Cicerato. So what Richard is saying is that if people were in your environment or in the environment of the CAPC, so for six months, Mm -hmm. so it means that they operated undetected. So there are two issues that you need to be mindful of in terms of the global um, average. There's the mean time to detect and there's a mean time to respond. So the global average in terms of the mean time to detect has gone down. But the meantime to respond has not gone down. Mm. And the regulator needs to analyze both to understand the significance and the impact. But very importantly, uh, how do you secure as of the date that you become aware as the CIPC from further harm, but it might be a little too late for the smaller businesses who might not even know what a security compromise is, and yeah. they could maybe just find out when they suffer a financial loss, um, when they query um, through their, um, whoever is the financial person mm-hmm. with the bank a certain transaction, and that's now when um, they now become yeah. aware of some fraud, as um, yeah. Richard was saying. But that's now the extent to which we need to analyze the fact that um, there was a security compromise, how long were the people in the environment to understand the meantime to detect mm. and then to understand when did they respond, right. the meantime to respond, so that we can also analyze what is the actual extent of the harm okay. caused and exposure. And from what you're saying is, you know, so there's the attack and it's, and it's easy to detect it when you detect it, but then the regulator responds and then it still needs to trickle down to the user on the other end or to the client on the other end. So even if the regulators intervened, your business, your coffee shop, your franchise, it might take a while before the impact is felt by you. Yeah, look, so the CAPC did notify data subjects about the security compromise, but unfortunately it wasn't done in terms of the, if I can use the word, compliance requirements that the information regulator would want to have due to the types and the sensitivity Mm -hmm. of the information. So the information regulator has now advised as to the type of notification that should go out to the affected data subjects so that they can take reasonable measures and steps to ensure that they are not further compromised. What does the law say about sharing of information? So we know that this is an attack, it's a hack. So even if you've taken precautions, the system was breached. But in general, what are the rules? Because if we take it away from CIPC, we're all suffering here as power listeners from people just calling us and selling us products and we don't know where they get the numbers from and they call on the hour, every hour from all over the country and they're selling insurance products and they're selling you medical insurance and they know so much about you. 
Yeah. So you need to distinguish um, between two types uh, when you talk about marketing. Are you an existing client? And are you a person who is not a client of that specific institution? Mm -hmm. So Section 69.1 would come into play. Sections... But let's leave the sections out. So what is very important for us is, are you an existing client or are you not? So if you are not, before you can sell a product to me or services, you need to first get my permission. And the permission that you need to obtain from me must be in terms of a prescribed form from the the information regulator prescribed to ask me. And I must then... Uh, confirm or consent in writing, Mm. and then you can start to market. So there are two issues here. So the first one is, did you obtain my consent? But the first, very first one is, where did you obtain my personal information? Because the law requires that you obtain it from me directly. Okay, but people are obviously violating that because I can accept what you're saying. So you're saying, if I am a customer of uh, Telco X, Correct. Okay, so I'm a customer of Vodacom or MTN or Neotel or whatever it is. Then, when I got into that contract, there I may have given consent. So if they're harassing me, it's because somewhere along the line, being a customer, I've already said you can sell me products. There's still a, a consent required, so they give you two blocks. Would you want us to sell you? information right. when you fill up and you become a client. Right. But very importantly, and going back to um, the points that Richard is making, so it's very important for us to understand that um, if you are not a client, there's a high possibility that the information that they use was um, not acquired exactly. in terms of the law, and that in itself could be a possibility of a security compromise. And that's what we're talking about. So if you are a customer, that's why I'm just going to use the example. If you're a customer of Telcom or, or MTN or Vodacom, whatever, somewhere along the line when you were renewing your contract or getting a new phone, you may have said, yes, you can market products to me. Correct. That's why they're calling you. Yes. But by the time a random service provider is phoning you, you've never heard of them, you've never been a customer of theirs, but they have your number, that could be an indication of a security breach. And it happens uh, when we visit these secure estates and we are so eager to visit our family, our friends or whoever, and we now give the details and those details might not be secure and they might be sold to a third party and the selling thereof might constitute a security compromise. Okay, just before we carry on with you, Richard, let's talk on Ola, you've got something to say? Hi, Lorato. This is quite an, an, a very, very sensitive uh, topic because some of us are business people doing business with the state. And I can tell you, for the past uh, couple of hours or many hours that the CAPC information, including um, CSD, by the way, which is a central database of government business. Now, in the main, can we, put, we really put the figure of loss in terms of the economic loss? And two, can, can, can we, we, the liability of the losses there for businesses, can it be claimed against the state, considering that the state is the custodian of our information, particularly within their central database? Can, can, can we as business that suffered the loss claim against the state in line with Popeyes uh, that we, we didn't consent for malware to, you know, to sort of, in, in a narrative, I mean, in a figurative, um, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, figuratively uh, agreeing to that malware of, of the intrusion of our data. Okay. Do, we, do we have a leg to stand on there? Okay. Let's ask from the security side, Richard Frost, how would you respond? Yeah, I think it's 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 quite an interesting question. Um, obviously, mm-hmm. there would be some form of liability, you know, you gathering people's information, now you've had a breach. Um, I think that's for the regulator to determine, you know, how much of, of that liability is with the the CI um, PC, if they determine negligence, in other words, um, they didn't do enough to actually secure that information and um, there was information that's not publicly accessible um, leaked, then obviously they would be found liable and, and okay. there would be um, recourse. You could probably take up legal action you know, against right. the, the CIPC. 
I think the issue that you'd have there, though, is to kind of claim back for those damages would be costly as well. So unless you won the case, you know, you would you'd probably just be forking out a lot of money um, to try and recover okay. some stuff. The type of crime that you're going to be seeing is going to be more fraud. You're going to probably find people are going to either utilize the credit card information or they're going to try and open up credit accounts in, in a legitimate company's name, um, maybe make some purchases and then not pay for it. And obviously mm. the legitimate company would be challenged then for payment. And I think then it's going to become a legal battle again. Okay. Okay. And so, you know, this is on the security side. I really wanted you to answer us, but perhaps advocate, you can help us understand legally yes. liability and compensation. And if negligence is found to have played a part here, do all of these businesses registered with CIPC have recourse? So a civil class action is possible in terms of section 99 of POPIA. And that section 99 empowers the information regulator to join in on the class action. And that class action can then be lodged and then there can then be um, financial compensation. But it would depend, as Richard is saying, what is the outcome of the investigation that the information regulator is currently conducting in terms of Section 76.3, which is our own initiative investigation, uh, because um, we've decided not to go the Section 89.1 yeah. route. So that type of report becomes critical and a basis for um, class action that is okay. possible in terms of Section 99 of POPIA. I don't really understand the law, but class action is when people who don't know each other but have suffered the same fate. Yes. They come together. It's the group of people sure. that were subjected to that specific um, security compromise and um, that class action is then brought and the information regulator can then join them okay. in support of that class action in terms of section 99 okay. so that's the extent of and the legal principles yeah. that supports the caller's um, okay. action uh, are you satisfied first you have to wait for the regulator's investigation to be concluded but if it finds that perhaps the problem was on the side of CIPC you and many other business owners can come together in a combined lawsuit. I, I'm making notes quite uh, attentively. And lastly, <laughs> mind you, that thing is happening during load shedding, mm. adding another pillar of challenge towards that business part of a loss in terms of revenue that I, I wanted to actually attach the value to it to say, uh, you know, th th there's just so much for us as business people that goes on. And yeah. like I always call to to, to to try and motivate fellow business people that in as much as we, 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 we become despondent, we need not lose hope. But, you know, when things like this continue to happen, it, yeah. it literally just to break the camel's back. But yeah. anyway, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Richard, I want to come back to you because just to understand what we mean by some of the terminology. So you say that there can be ransomware. Malware, which is kind of looking for the problem, then ransomware, then either when you find it, you pay for it, and then clean up your systems. And we know that there's a ransomware gang. Uh, tell us how this all works, because apparently this is the second cyber attack since 2021. Yeah, so I think from a terminology perspective, when we mention uh, malware, we're referring to malicious software. So a ransomware is a form of malware. Mm -hmm. um, the difference with ransomware is it specifically um, would encrypt your system so that you wouldn't be able to access them. And then there would be form, a form of extortion where you'd receive an email saying, you know, pay us 10 Bitcoin if you want to be able to access your systems. Your typical crypto ransomware is exactly that. It will ask you for some form of cryptocurrency as payment to, to decrypt your machine. So you get a, a password that would be sent to you and you'd in, um, put that into your systems and it would obviously decrypt your, your systems and you'd be able to access them again. Mm. What some people aren't aware of, as, as I mentioned before, is the fact that some flavors of, of ransomware do the data exfiltration in the background first. And only once it can no longer find data to exfiltrate, it will actually encrypt the machines and then do the extortion component. So if we look at um, the Irish National Health Services, they had a, yeah. a data breach, which also resulted with the ransomware. And while they were trying to fix their systems that already had um, data exfiltrated, the long-term effect of that breach was patients, um, you know, in the different government hospitals mm. were receiving accounts that looked like they were legitimate accounts from the hospital, you know, requiring settlement, mm. and the banking details had just been changed. So you had a lot of 
people that had gone in for a, a normal procedure that maybe owed 500 pounds or 500 euros, yeah. you know, to the, the, the medical facilities, yeah. went and paid this money into the incorrect sure. bank, okay. which belonged to the threat actors. Okay. Similar type of thing we might start seeing, you know, with the, the data breaches in South Africa. Yeah. There's a lot going on. We've run out of time. Advocate, any last words? Because this is CIPC. Then you wonder for municipalities they don't even have barely resources yes. to run their affairs if this happened at that level it would be a disaster it could be and what is very important for us is that um, we need to ensure that the banking side the banking details where there's a lot of financial exposure is resecured by changing your password and changing all other security details okay. so that you don't suffer um, any type of direct loss or indirect loss, but okay. also for your finance department to be vigilant and to ensure that they are in constant contact with um, the CIPC and the information regulator. So the first thing you can just do as an individual is change your password. Just start there. Correct. And then the rest will have to unfold. Exactly. Thank you so much to Advocate Colin uh, Weppend, who is responsible for Popia, the information regulator, Richard Frost, head of consulting for the Amata Cybersecurity.